Hey, so uh, originally uh, we were scheduled to, to kick off a brand new message series in the New Testament book of Acts, and uh, that is still very much our plan to do that this fall. In fact, uh, not only will we study that on Sunday mornings, but in our community groups we'll, we'll be studying Acts as well. Uh, but after everything that happened Friday, if I'm just being honest, man, I, I just wasn't there. I uh, was not there to, to start the series, and so... Um, what I want to do today is, is actually talk about a subject that I think all of us can relate to and I think is really relevant to this season uh, in our church's life. And that how do, we, how do we mourn with those who mourn? Because you, you may not have known the people who were involved in this accident, but all of us have times in our lives where we have to come alongside people in the middle of their grief. And you've probably had those moments too, where you've you've gone through some sort of loss or you've you've suffered in some way, and and in the middle of that, you, you saw people show up in your life who did that really well, and and they were so supportive and encouraging, and then others were actually it wasn't maybe that helpful, and so uh, the Bible commands us as Christians and and really as a, a body of Christ that. That we would do that, that we're going to show up in each other's lives and encourage each other during hard times. Uh, but it also gives us, I think, some principles and some insight to, to what that actually looks like on a, a practical basis. So that's where we're going to head today. Um, so if you're taking notes, I want to give you kind of three big ideas, three kind of big concepts about it. Uh, and the first one is you just got to show up. Like the very first step to being there in times of crisis and grief is, is just to be there. Like you, you have to show up. And, and when I say show up, I'm not just talking about physically, but emotionally and spiritually for people. And that can be difficult. Right? Like, can we just be honest about that? Like when, when people are facing tragedy, sometimes it's really hard for us to want to step into that because we know how emotionally taxing that can be. And you may be in a place where you say, man, I, I want to be there for them, but I, I just I don't know what to say. Other times, uh, stepping into that space is difficult for us because it's triggering from our own past and things that we've walked through personally. And, and so that brings up our own memories. And then we feel bad for thinking about ourselves when they're, they're hurting. And, and it just creates maybe a situation where you think, well, it'd just be better for me uh, to kind of pray for them at a distance. But what people really need from us is, is to be there. I love what Proverbs says, chapter 17. It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a difficult time. Another translation says, a, a brother is born for a, adversity. That's when our friends should show up the most. First uh, Thessalonians, chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is describing what life was like in the early church as he would invest his life in the people that he ministered to. And he says this, he says, we cared so much for you that we were pleased to share with you not only the gospel of God. And, and that's what it's all about. I mean, here at Coastal, you come any length of time, you're going to find out, man, it is all about helping people know and follow Jesus. We want to point people to Jesus all the time. But we're not only going to proclaim this good news about Jesus, but it says this is, we shared our lives as well because you became dear to us. There's a, a relational component to what it means to being part of the body of Christ. I think about how Jesus modeled this in John chapter 11. He had some friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And one day he got news that Lazarus was really sick and they wanted Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. And so they sent word to him and he says, okay, I'm, I'm going to come, but... It may not be quite in your timing. And so Jesus shows up a few days later and Lazarus had already passed. And, and you can imagine kind of walking into a room. And some of you have had those experiences where you walk into a funeral service or maybe a visitation and people are just, just weeping and crying. And, and that's what I imagine that it was like for Jesus walking into that room as people were just mourning the death of Lazarus. And he sees he sees his friends. He sees Mary and Martha. And they're, they're just so distraught and they're, they're crying. And, and the shortest verse in all of scripture is just simply, it says that Jesus wept. 
And what's interesting about that is he wept even knowing that he was about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Like he knew the outcome, but he still wept. And the reason he wept is because he had empathy for his friends right there. That's what, that's what caused that. And so part of what it just means to be a Christian, part of what it means to be part of a local body of, of Christ is, is, is to develop those sort of relationships. And, and by the way, that's one of the reasons why we put so much emphasis here on, on taking a next step beyond Sunday morning, of being involved in some sort of, of group and, and serving. Because here's the deal, you can come every single week, I mean, for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. But you're never really going to build the sort of heart level friendships until you get in smaller circles. And, and we want that for you. In fact, we, we actually think that that's one of the most transforming things that you could ever experience in your life is to have those sort of relationships in your life. And so as you try to show up in the lives of people, just a couple kind of practical things. Um, sometimes that means being relationally sensitive to how you communicate with that person and, and when. So if you're close to someone, then, then you know what? They, they may really need you to show up physically. Like they need to hug your neck. They need to see your face. Like you need to be there with them in that moment. For others, maybe the appropriate thing is it's a phone call or text message. Uh, maybe you, you, you write a card. Maybe it's an opportunity to be there at, at a visitation or, or to be there at at the funeral service, but, but figure out what does that look like for you based on the relationship that you have with that person, and, and, and what would it feel like on their end to be able to say, yeah, they were there for me. And then we do that you know, spiritually by praying, and, and I just want to encourage you, I mean, how easy is it for us to hear about needs and say that we're praying for those people and then not do it? I think, honestly, the, the, the thing that makes us most guilty of that is social media. I mean, how easy is it for someone to post about something that's going on and, and you just look at the comments, praying for you, praying, praying, praying. How many of those people actually pray? Right? So to, to actually go before God and pray on their behalf is a huge deal. And, and if you feel comfortable, I would encourage you to even do that with them. I mean, whether that's in person or on, over the phone. There's a huge difference between someone saying, hey, I'm praying for you, and then someone praying for you and, and being there in that moment. And then, you, you know, you're going to look for physical needs to meet, right? Like whether that's uh, bringing a meal or uh, buying a gift card to a local restaurant. Uh, one of the things that was really helpful for our family when my grandmother passed uh, a couple years ago is, is there was just a group of people who came to her house and we had all of our extended family at the house. And their only role that day was just to serve our family. There was food coming in and uh, dishes to be washed. And so instead of kind of the usual suspects in our family having to do that kind of stuff, they, they took care of all that. They said, here, let me get in the kitchen and, and just do something practical. And, and that's something, by the way, that I think is uh, it's not exclusive to Christians. But when, when Christians actually are, are living in that sort of healthy community, it stands out. Uh, because people who, who don't have that sort of network around them don't experience that sort of love and care. Uh, a, a Christian who is in the middle of those relationships experiences that comfort in a way that people outside the church, quite frankly, do not experience. And I've, I've been around a whole lot of funerals, and you can talk to some funeral directors, and they'll tell you the exact same thing. That the body of Christ shows up way different than the people on the outside. Here's another thing, and this is really important to me. This is kind of a pet peeve. Um, but you, you've got to be able to avoid theological cliches. Those little trite sayings that, that may sound good off the tip of your tongue, but are actually packed with really bad theology. And they can, they can actually be much more harmful than helpful. So people will tend to say things like, Man, I'm so sorry for your loss. You know, God just needed them more than we did. And God is not lacking for anything. That's not right. Or, 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 or there's another angel in heaven. Listen, 
When we die, if you're in Christ, you'll spend eternity with him. But what the Bible says is that we actually will, will govern and judge angels. We don't become an angel. That we actually are elevated above the angels. And so, no, you don't, you don't go to heaven and get cupid wings in the back and you're hanging out on the clouds. Like, that's not it. I think about, from a biblical perspective, there's this guy named Job in the Old Testament in the Bible. And, man, Job had it worse than just about anybody you can think of. Like, if there's ever anybody who had suffered tragedy, it's Job. And, and Job was a righteous and a good man. In fact, he was so righteous that Satan saw him and said, listen, the only reason your servant Job is faithful to you is because you have blessed him. And, and Satan almost kind of like makes a wager with God. He, he wants to, to kind of test Job and says, I bet that if you remove your hand of blessing from Job's life, that he will curse you. And God says, no, I don't don't think so. And so God allows Job to afflict uh, Job with with all these horrible things. He loses his family. He loses everything that he owns. He he loses his health. He's sick. Uh, Just a horrible situation. And then uh, Job's actually kind of a fairly long book, but you're going to see chapter after chapter after chapter of Job having this dialogue with his friends. And, and they call him his friends, but I, I'm not sure how actually friendly they were. I mean, the, the kind of conversation that they have to him is, is really just horrible because in that kind of ancient Near Eastern worldview, if you were walking through hardship, it's because you did something wrong. Anything that bad happened in your life, it was the result of kind of cosmic karma. You're like, man, if... If you, if you lost a child or you got sick, you go, man, what did you do to deserve that? Because God never gives good people hardship. It, it only must come to, to bad people. And check out, check out what, what a Job says, one of his friends says in Job 4. He says this. He says, consider who has perished when he was innocent. Where have the honest been destroyed? And then verse 8, he says, in my experience... Those who plow injustice and those who sow trouble reap the same. Can you imagine being Job? And you have lost everything in your life. And your friend comes to, to you and says, you know, I've, I've seen that uh, those who plow injustice reap it. So surely you must have done something wrong for this to happen. Listen, man, that is, that is terrible theology. And in those moments when we maybe even have good intentions, man, we can do so much damage. Uh, years ago, um, uh, I lost a cousin in a car accident. Uh, he was just 18 years old. And um, if I'm just, just being completely real, uh, this situation has been, been triggering for me in that, right? Um, it, I just, you just have flashbacks to what that felt like. Um, and I remember being at the funeral, and the preacher who was doing the funeral that day came up to my aunt and uncle, and he was trying to console them. And I don't know his exact words, but essentially he said something like, um, there was nothing God could do. That this isn't God's fault. There's nothing that he could do. Can I just tell you how messed up that is? Do you know who God is? The creator of the heavens and the earth? Who is sovereign king over the universe? You don't think that in the case of a car accident, he couldn't divinely intervene and and cause a car to be even two seconds slower so that a crash in an intersection doesn't occur? Don't don't you think that God could do that? Here's, Here's the deal. We do live in a broken and fallen world. It is broken by sin. Uh, in Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve sin, and ever since that day, man, this world is broken. Romans chapter 8 tells us that creation itself groans. That means that the, the brokenness of our physical environment is 
is distorted. It's, it's not like the perfection of the Garden of Eden. We live in a world where there's hurricanes and earthquakes and floods and all sorts of just horrible things. But it also means that our bodies itself are, are fragile, that we are susceptible to illness and disease and injury. And it means that, that people have the ability to choose sin, to make sinful choices. And sometimes those sinful choices that other people make affect us. And so you and I, man, we are functioning in a world that is very much broken. Now that, is, that is gospel truth. But it's also true that God is good. That his very nature is goodness. It's holiness. It's righteousness. It's goodness. It's love. He, he, he literally is the definition of love. If you want to know what love looks like, it's God. He's the picture of it. So God is, is both good, but he's also in control, which means that there are times when he intervenes. I mean, have you ever thought about this? That there are times that God has intervened to save your life and you didn't even know it. You ever thought about that? I mean, how, how often do we get on these roads? Man, that could happen to us. That could happen to any of us. And there are times when God does choose to intervene. And then there are times when he doesn't choose to intervene. And and I think a very natural question, and I've gotten this question from students, from adults, um, not only lately, but just all the time, where people say, why did God allow this to happen? Can I give you the, the appropriate theological response? The answer is, I don't know. That's the answer. Don't try to speculate. Don't try to say, well, God was doing this. I mean, you do not know the mind of God. You are not qualified to speak on his behalf when it comes to those things. You don't know. I don't know. I don't know why it happened. But I do trust that he's good. And I trust that his promises are true. I trust that, that God will work all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That ultimately he will take what is broken and messed up and somehow he will glorify his name through it. And I don't have to, to see it in the moment. I don't have to be able to, to kind of connect the dots and say, hey, this is how God did it. But I trust that he does. He trusts that he does. Um, listen, let me help you guys out. Sometimes when you are in those moments and you're talking to someone who's, who's going through loss, you just, you don't know what to say. You know what you say? Nothing. Just be there. You don't have to say anything in that moment, particularly when it's fresh. Now, there, there are times when, when theology does come into play, when it is very much appropriate to, to help someone think about it, but, but that's not in the moment. Like, that's not when it's fresh. In the moment, what they need you to be is a kind and loving and compassionate and empathetic presence in their lives. That's what they, they just need you to be there. And so you may even find that a person is saying some stuff that your, your theological ears go, oh, that's actually not right. Listen, be really careful about trying to play seminary professor in that moment. That you're going to try to kind of correct their theology in that moment. That's not the time for it. You want to just be there. And be a tangible expression of God's love and his mercy in people's lives. And then here's the third thing. And this is, I think, probably the most important is that we just want to point people to Jesus. At the end of the day, here's the deal. Uh, a Chick-fil-A tray is great, but it, it, doesn't, it doesn't actually bring any sort of lasting comfort or peace. The only thing that brings lasting comfort and peace and hope is Jesus Christ. That's the only thing. A peace that passes all understanding, that sort of supernatural peace that comes from Jesus. 
And so we, we've got to, to, to recognize that part of what God wants to do in the middle of hardship and suffering and pain is actually get people's attention and, and point them to him. And, and we want to do that in, in a way that's uh, emotionally and relationally sensitive. But at the same time, don't miss your moment. That this is the time to testify, to talk about what God has done. One of the weirdest books in the Bible is the book of Ecclesiastes. It's in the Old Testament and it was written by a guy named Solomon. Solomon was king of Israel and uh, he's unique in so many ways because at the very beginning of his reign, uh, God asked Solomon, says, hey, you can ask for anything that you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon says, I want wisdom. And so God gave Solomon a supernatural amount of wisdom, uh, kind of the middle section of the Bible is, is actually called wisdom literature. And a lot of it was actually written by Solomon. So Proverbs, a lot of those are, are his. Ecclesiastes is one of those books as well. And, um, and Solomon, you know, from a, a leadership standpoint, was actually really successful. He, he led Israel to its golden age in terms of prominence in the ancient world. They had trade uh, routes go in. They had treaties with other foreign nations, and they become extremely prosperous under his rule. But one of the the ways that he was able to orchestrate that is is that he 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 actually married women from other countries. It was it was kind of part of an ancient tradition that in order to establish alliance. And so uh, Solomon just didn't have one wife. He had like a hundred wives, and a lot of those wives ended up bringing their foreign religions. To him, and so he, even though he was one of the wisest people who's ever lived on the planet, he actually made some boneheaded decisions in that he allowed these these foreign ideas to to, to infiltrate his own theology. And so Solomon, by the end of his life, is is kind of a mess. You know, like he's he's been successful, he's pursued all the things that the world tells you that are important. And, and if anybody could say, hey, man, I've seen it all and I've done it all, it was Solomon. And so you, you open up Ecclesiastes, and it is the most depressing book of the Bible to ever read. Like, if you, you probably shouldn't ever read it, honestly, uh, until you're, like, after 30 years old. Like, I mean, it's just, it is, you, you have to understand the perspective that it's written from. And he just talks about meaningless, meaningless, everything under the sun is, is meaningless. And then he says something in chapter 7, and, and I think this is one of the, the key verses that I think all of us should, should be exposed to. It's, it's beautiful truth. He says this. He says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting, since that is the end of all mankind. Or, or other translations say, because death is the, the destiny of every man, and the living should take this to heart. The truth is, is that these types of moments are, are natural times for people to think about their own eternity. And we have a, there's a window when people who may have been closed off to the gospel, to hearing about eternal things, that there's maybe a sensitivity that they're open to having that conversation. And so when it comes to sharing our faith, I think there are times when the best approach is kind of a propositional approach, like almost like Christian apologetics, that you're going to help people understand from an intellectual standpoint that the Bible can be trusted and that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father through him, that you can kind of build a case. If you think about uh, books like The Case for Easter, or The Case for Christ, like there's, there are times when that sort of approach is appropriate. But then there are other times where the, the most effective thing you can do is actually just tell your own story of what God's done in your life. And that's, that's actually kind of what I, I do in those moments. I, I don't speak to, to what other people may be experiencing. I just, I just tell them about my own experience with God. And you see that a couple places in the Bible. I, I think the Apostle Paul, who, who wrote just about half the New Testament and started all these churches, man, he was really good at doing both. There are times where Paul makes a theological case for Christ, but then there are other times where he's very personal, and he's just expressing what God's done in his life. Check this out. This is uh, first, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, and he's just talking about his experience. He says, he says, five times 
I've received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I've spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention... Other things, there is a daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Paul says, listen, I've been through some stuff. Man, if you want to compare notes about hardship, I've done it. I've been through some hard things. But the same guy who says, man, this is what I've been through, also says in Philippians chapter 4, he says, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I find myself in. I know how to make do with little. I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I am able to do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. By the way, that verse is not about athletics. You can't just put Philippians 4.13 on your, write it on your, your tennis shoes and expect you're going to be able to dunk You need more help than that. Right? That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, I've learned that God is faithful even in the midst of hardship and that through him and in him, I can do all things. That I can do the things that God has called me to do. I can endure the things that God has called me to endure. And church, can I just tell you, I mean, I have no clue where you guys are at kind of emotionally. And I, I, in fact, I, I would imagine that it's kind of all over the room, right? Some of you, man, life is going great. Some of you are here this morning, and man, you're just, your heart's sick. But here, here's what I know, that even in the darkest valleys, man, God shows up. Man, even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, man, he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. And we have that good shepherd who cares for us and protects us and provides for us. Man, I have experienced that in my life. And I want you to experience that as well. And I know that some of you, I know that some of you could stand up right now, and if we had time, you could, you could literally kind of testify to God's goodness and his faithfulness in, in your life, that he has been with you through the darkest moments. But some of you are like, man, I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out, and I feel alone. Like, you don't have to feel alone. You can experience God's presence. You can experience his peace. And you can be part of a body of Christ who will love you and care for you. And I want that for you. So here's the deal, man. We, we're going to sing. And I hope this, this moment is really just a time for you to worship and to praise. And you do some business with God. But we also know that, man, some of you just need to pray. And so we've got a great prayer team in the back. They want to pray with you. If you have questions about what it looks like to to trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, we want to help you do that. Um, We want to be here for you in that. So um, I want to pray for us, and then we're going to stay, and the band's going to come, and we'll worship. Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, that even in the midst of tragedy and hardship, God, that you are a good and faithful God. You never promise us a life without pain, but you do promise that you'll be with us in the pain that you'll never leave us or forsake us. And that's a promise that we hold on dear today. God, that we need your presence at work in our lives. God, we need your strength. God, give us eyes to see and ears ears to hear when we hear about people who are hurting. God, that as a body of Christ, that we could literally be your hands and feet in that moment to encourage and, and, and love and comfort those who are walking through difficulty. God, use our lives, use our church for the sake of your glory. God, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen.